All right, good evening. Uh, welcome to the 12th and last plenary session. Uh, they will be uh, truncated since Mark's already gone. I asked Mark earlier whether, how he wanted an introduction. He said, hey, listen, uh, to tell people that so there's uh, it's me between them and, and a beer tonight. So 8.30, eight outing to Huntington after this, but uh, in between now and then, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Peter Redpath, who is uh, my uh, dissertation director, uh, currently a student with uh, the Adler Clients Institute. And uh, Dr. Redpath here will be speaking on how the organizational and behavioristic psychology of St. Thomas Aquinas can help educate present and future leaders to become grandmasters of competition and living in our intensely competitive digital age. Um, before I start, uh, once again, um, if uh, Sebastian Mafoud and his wife are out uh, in the audience, uh, I wanted to um, extend our uh, our uh, expressions of uh, love and warmth uh, to them and their family, and hope everything is going well with them. Uh, and Lois Evelis, uh, our colleague, had gotten injured uh, this evening, and uh, the last I heard is Lois was on her way back from. Uh, the hospital, but she hasn't returned as of yet, and so we're all hoping and uh, that she's that she's fine. Uh, and uh, that being said, uh, let me start to go into this paper that I could have given a much shorter title to, but um, <laughs> I I thought well might as well try to condense as much as possible of what the content is in, in summary uh, there. And I hope this is not going to be nearly as long as the paper I gave the, the first day. Uh, but uh, I hope it might be able to clarify some of the problems that we've been talking about recently, especially in relationship to memory and imagination, among other things. When more than 50 years ago I first started to read the works of St. Thomas, uh, I was fascinated by his organizational genius and wondered about precisely what was the chief cause of it while I puzzled about that question throughout these years, it wasn't until I, I, I started writing uh, this not so elementary Christian metaphysics a couple of years ago and uh, started to do the second volume of it last year and the, the moral psychology of, I mean, in 2016, and the moral psychology of St. Thomas Aquinas uh, this past year, too, that I started to realize the chief reason he was such an organizational genius was because. At work as the first principle of all his reasoning, including his understanding of philosophy and science, or philosophy science, uh, uh, in his understanding, was an organizational psychology that he had synthesized with a behavioristic psychology through his reading of the ancients, especially contact with the works of Aristotle, Plotinus, the Church Fathers, and Scripture. While some members of the audience who have read the works of St. Thomas might not be shocked by my claim that his organizational genius was caused by an organizational psychology, they might be puzzled by my claim that essentially connected to that organizational psychology as a first principle uh, out of which the, the whole of philosophy has been generated within ancient Greek culture was a behavioristic psychology. How could anyone seriously make such a claim easily? Evidence should be that I'm predicating the term behavioristic psychology analogously. By it, I don't mean univocally the same Pavlovian deterministic psychology contained in the teaching of, of a modern thinker like Boris Frederick Skinner, but I do mean something analogous to it, a psychology that essentially contains determinism and education through pleasure, pain, response. When I refer to the behavioristic psychology of St. Thomas Aquinas, or Thomistic behavioristic psychology, I'm talking about a synthesis of a facultative and moral psychology that St. Thomas realized had essentially generated the ancient Greek philosophical scientific mind and had reached its maturity in the teachings of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and Plotinus. Today, some people might call the faculty psychology to which I refer a philosophical anthropology, a philosophical understanding of the human person. While to some extent they would not be far off, strictly speaking, I don't think they'd be right. Part of the behavioristic psychology of St. Thomas 
is an understanding of the human person, but because this understanding of the human person is more primitive than is St. Thomas's comprehension of the nature of philosophy, science, it cannot be a philosophical or scientific anthropology. In fact, he considers philosophy, science, to presuppose a precise, proper understanding of the human person. For him, a proper understanding of the human person serves as a first principle, a principle of right reason that generates philosophy, science. We cannot be wrong about the nature of human beings and expect to be right about the nature of philosophy, science. Proper understanding of philosophy essentially involves recognizing philosophy, that philosophy is a psychological act, an act of the human soul generated by harmonizing several faculties and habits of the soul to be capable of experiencing sense wonder and possess the desire and choice to satisfy them. Without that experience in the mind of St. Thomas, and I'm reading into his mind now, uh, no human being can become a philosopher scientist. And properly speaking, no social group can develop a philosophical or scientific culture. According to St. Thomas, only because they had reached a stage of psychological development in which to some extent they were capable of realizing the existence of a human soul possessed of natural faculties within an organic body could the ancient Greeks come to comprehend how one human being can perform many acts, which is essential to understanding and exercising the nature of philosophy, science. Strictly speaking, any person who claims to be a philosopher scientist, to possess human knowledge in its most perfect form, must be able to explain how one person, a philosopher, scientist, is capable of performing many acts and still remain one person, and how one science can study many subjects and still remain one science. Uh, St. Thomas talks about this in his treatise on man uh, in, this, in the summer, uh, referring to this peculiar ability to explain one person doing many acts as only cap capable in terms of this, this faculty psychology. Strictly speaking, in the mind of St. Thomas, no person who fails in the ability to give this explanation can legitimately make claim to be a philosopher or scientist. <clears throat> As St. Thomas realized from his study of Aristotle, and Aristotle's teaching about philosophy, science, and I came to realize, perhaps about 30 years ago, <clears throat> only a faculty or power psychology can serve as such a knowing subject of philosophy, science. As by the time of Aristotle, the ancient Greeks had properly conceived of philosophy science. Strictly speaking, they had rightly recognized it not to be some amorphous body of knowledge floating around somewhere, or logical system of clear and distinct ideas existing in some collection of social feelings called the mind, as do Descartes and his progeny. They had conceived of it as a habit of a human knowing faculty, power, generated by a living principle, a soul, that causes organic life within a body. Just as no habit of walking can exist uh, within a living being unless some animal exists with legs possessed of a faculty uh, uh, to order movement of those legs in a habitually harmonious way, so no act of philosophy or science can exist without a human soul in which faculties and habits transmit life to and grow organs within a multitude capable of being unified into organizational parts of a living body. <clears throat> Having a faculty psychology, however, is not enough to generate philosophy, science within an individual human being or culture. Beyond the faculty psychology, <clears throat> as part of the right behavioristic psychology to develop a philosophical scientific habit of mind, a person or culture needs right reason and right desire. A moral culture that has developed a sense of prudence capable of giving up to a person or society an awareness of the dangers that ignorance can cause and the need to overcome these dangers by understanding and mastering their causes. Underlying the development of a philosophical scientific habit of soul is a determinism rooted in the natural human desire to
to preserve and protect individual and species human life, and to seek good and avoid evil, an inclination not to remain psychologically stagnant, but really to advance the cause of human life and health by becoming psychologically healthy, or more healthy, perfect, more perfect, great as possible, a grand master of competition at living well. As I made evident in the talk I gave yesterday about the moral psychology of St. Thomas and his teaching about prudence, only possession of a healthy estimate of intelligence can hope to educate a person to seek to become a great competitor, virtuous, psychologically to excel, become, a great, become great at doing doable deeds. According to St. Thomas, estimate of intelligence Having a healthy faculty of particular or cogitative reason is essentially involved in apprehending and achieving all human organizational greatness and excellence. According to him, estimative intelligence plays a crucial, essential role both in practical and speculative reasoning in being able properly to engage in induction of the nature of an organization of and of its organizational unity and greatness. Sense and intellectually grasp organizational first principles, the parts that chiefly hold an organization together, apprehend and reasonably calmly command and control competitive human appetites and emotions, precisely comprehend and control as much as possible the circumstances of organizational action. What I have chosen to call estimative intelligence, St. Thomas considered to be the chief knowing faculty through which human beings, one, stay in touch with sense reality, and two, sense qualitative unity, greatness, strength, excellence, health and harmony, and their opposites within organizations and organizational actions around us and within ourselves. Considered as such, estimative intelligence plays an essential, crucial role in all acts of induction, in the ability of human beings to induce the operative principles that unite multitudes into parts of a whole, into organizations, including one's own physical and psychological condition. Estimative intelligence is the chief faculty as Galileo Galilei appears vaguely to have uh, comprehended centuries ago, through which we stretch the imagination so as to extend our ability to conceive of qualitatively greater things and actions and seek to advance in personal greatness. It's the chief sensory source of induction, the competitive emotions, poetic imagination, and philosophical scientific wonder. Uh, I th think that, strictly speaking, without this understanding of estimative intelligence, uh, particular reason, uh, philosophical wonder, as well as poetic imagination from which it first arises, cannot exist. The reason for this is chiefly because of all external and internal sense faculties, when perfected through possession of prudence, more than any other sense faculty, estimative intelligence keeps us in touch with the whole of reality and constantly provides us with an accurate assessment, self-understanding of the qualitative health and strength of our faculties, our personal strengths and weaknesses. Strictly speaking, without it, no sense or intellectual faculty keeps us in touch with sense reality. And once we become unmoored from sense reality, the human imagination and sense memory can no longer serve the human intellect as accurate measures of the difference between appearance and reality. Well, many students of St. Thomas are to some extent aware of his teaching about the external senses. Beyond some knowledge of his teaching about the common sense, few have much awareness about what he says regarding cogitative or particular reason, what in brute animals he calls instincts or the estimative sense. For those unaware, uh, now this conference has good, been a good time to start to learn about it. According to St. Thomas, apart from the five commonly recognized external senses of touch, taste, smell, hearing, and sight, all higher forms of animal life and human beings possess four internal sense faculties, common sense, imagination, estimative sense in humans, particular or 
cogitative reasons and, and sense memory. About the, the common sense, St. Thomas tells us that among other things, it enables us on a sense level to distinguish the difference of the act of one sense faculty from another, to know, for example, that what we are hearing and the faculty of hearing differ from what we are seeing and the faculty of sight. As a storage facility, or what he calls a th thesaurus of common sense, St. Thomas maintains that we human beings possess a faculty that he calls the imagination. By this, St. Thomas does not mean a faculty that stores pictures. As far as I understand him, he means a psychological power that houses our prior knowledge of individual sense events. It resembles what today many people would call memory. It stores knowledge of particular sense happenings that we can recall when not being activated by an external sense stimulus, huh? uh, or we could also. Uh, as distinct from the faculty of imagination, St. Thomas identifies another in sen internal sense faculty that he calls sense memory, differ differing from intellectual memory, which he distinguishes from intellectual memory. He calls this faculty the thesaurus of the estimative sense. By means of it, he maintains that higher animals and human beings store sense knowledge related to the natures of sensible things regarding their utility or lack of utility, their safety or danger, qualities that can help or hurt an animal as the sort of animal it happens to be. For example, the estimated sense of a sheep tells a sheep that a wolf is of such a nature that's dangerous to sheep. Hence, according to St. Thomas, the sheep instinctively avoids wolves, not because it dislikes the color of wolves, it does so because it immediately knows that wolves like to eat sheep, and that it's a sheep. Moreover, St. Thomas maintains that a dog does not chiefly delight in the sight of a rabbit as something enjoyable to see, or a lion delight in hearing the sound of some animal as this or that animal. They delight in them chiefly as a meal, not for aesthetic reasons. Crucial to understand about the relation between the sense memory and the imagination is that St. Thomas locates a sense awareness of time and of danger within the sense memory. In other words, the faculty that stores knowledge of the estimative sense, not the faculty that stores information from the common sense, makes evident to human beings a sense of danger and difficulty, utility and uselessness, as well as of time. This distinction is crucial to understand because it is essentially connected to where I think St. Thomas locates the two sense appetites, the concupiscible and the irascible, that serve as the seat of what St. Thomas calls the human passions, and most people today in the English-speaking world call emotions. According to St. Thomas, the first set of emotions, the concupiscible, which he identifies as essentially pleasure-seeking and pain-avoiding, I call propelling emotions. They consist, or this appetite consists of six psychological states consisting of three sets of contrary opposites. Love or liking and hatred or disliking, desire and aversion, and three, pleasure or pain, or when intellectually considered, joy and sorrow. The second set, the irascible, which St. Thomas identifies as essentially safety and utility seeking, and danger and difficulty avoiding, I call the contending or competitive emotions. It consists of five emotions, two sets of contrary opposites, hope and despair, fear and daring, plus the emotion of anger, which has no contrary opposite within the irascible appetite, but does have an opposite, pleasure or calm, existing within the concupiscible appetite. An appetite generically different from that of the irascible. The above distinctions about the differences between the common and estimative sense, the faculties of imagination and memory, and the emotional appetites that exist in essential connection with them are crucial to understand because on the basis of the way St. Thomas has identified them, the concupiscible appetite of which St. Thomas says temperance is the virtue must exist on the psychological level of the common sense faculty. While by nature, St. Thomas maintains that all human sense faculties and appetites react to external stimuli, formal objects, as real goods considered in and of themselves, the external sense faculties and the concupiscible appetite that is proximately seated in the human imagination, uh, as, a, as the storehouse of it anyway, are incapable of sensing real good and evil, are unable on the sense level 
to distinguish one from the other. The ability to distinguish such sensory goods and evils does not occur until some sense faculty within a human being is able generically to sense the natures of things, such as a sheep on the level of instinct or estimative intelligence, is able to sense the wolf as a natural enemy in relation to the sense memory upon the image of a wolf, enabling the sheep instinctively to recognize something in the image of a wolf that has escaped the notice of the common sense, that wolves eat sheep and that the animal sensing this is a sheep. Once this happens, the estimative sense activates the irascible passions, competitive emotions of fear and hope, which immediately cause the sheep not to syllogize about the situation, but to run. <laughs> While the passion, unless it's a British sheep maybe. While the passions <laughs> of fear and hope are also located in the irascible appetite of a human being, in contrast to a sheep, when confronted by a situation of danger under the influence of the moral virtues of prudence and courage, a human being might pause to syllogize, to liberate. One reason this is the case is that because the human intellect is operative within the estimative sense of human beings, unlike other animals, human beings have the ability to recognize the distinction between real and apparent goods. According to St. Thomas, because they lack an intellectual faculty, a particular reason, that intellectually communicates to a human being that what is being sensed as good or evil is really good or evil, all non-human animals consider all sensible goods and evils to be real goods and evils. Only human beings, only human animals, are animals capable of drawing a distinction between real and apparent goods. This awareness, in turn, is an essential foundation of all moral consciousness of the recognition that as human beings, to live lives as healthy as possible, we need to pursue qualities of competitive human excellence, like the virtues of temperance and courage that help morally to educate by means of rational command and control the emotions of fear and hope, habitually to sense the natures of real good and evil within individual situations. Unlike the passions of pleasure and pain, which St. Thomas maintains, on the concupiscible level, all animals, including human beings, essentially considered to be unqualifiably good and evil, all pleasures being essentially attractive is really good, and all pain being essentially repulsive is really bad to the concupiscible appetite. St. Thomas maintains that through the moral virtue of prudence present in the estimative sense, only human beings have a faculty that enables us to measure in terms of right reason whether what we fear or hope for, we should really fear or hope for, as a healthy human good or an unhealthy human evil. Moreover, considered in and of themselves, all psychologically healthy human beings essentially recognize on a syllogistic and observational level the rational nature of the emotions of hope and fear. Because other animals lack an abstract reasoning faculty, have the estimated sense as their highest knowing faculties, other animals cannot have such an experience. In so doing, all psychologically healthy human beings recognize that real goods and evils exist. And we can apprehend such goods and evils on a sense level through a well-educated estimative faculty. Hence, some kinds of things like poisonous substances and wild animals possess a kind of nature that is essentially evil, harmful, unhealthy for human beings. Considered as, as such, we should listen to our emotional response of fear when it happens in the presence of such substances and totally avoid such natures or only approach them with utmost caution. In contrast to such natures, psychologically healthy human beings also recognize that some natures like nourishing food and domesticated animals, pets, are not dangerous to avoid and are often beneficial to possess. Hence. Such individuals consider emotionally approaching them with hope to sit of safety to be a healthy psychological condition. Were we human beings not convinced about the reality of good and evil and our natural faculty of sense, to sense real goods and evils, no human being could consider the experiences of hope and fear to be rational. If no real goods and evils exist, the sensory experience of fear and hope and the rational conviction of the reasonableness to experiencing them to would be as irrational as would be the claims that cardinal moral virtues that rationally justify such goods and evils 
like temperance, courage, and justice exist. In other words, if you deny the reality of good and evil, uh, you're eventually going to deny the reality of hope and fear, uh, uh, as well as courage, honor, and all those uh, virtues connected with them. Such being the case, since recognition of the reality and reasonableness a moral consciousness first arises on the level of the estimative faculty with the prudent conviction of the reality of sense, good, and evil. Crucial to moral education for all human beings for all time is to have a well-educated estimative sense. This becomes a primitive first principle for philosophical reasoning, among other things. Indeed, according to St. Thomas, the whole of moral education is concerned with education of the estimative sense, particular reason through temperance, or proper, or what he calls healthy pleasure. For that education to be possible, as Aristotle, as Plato, Aristotle, and St. Thomas realized, human beings must possess knowing and appetitive faculties of an intellectual human soul, in which moral habits and cardinal moral virtues like temperance, courage, justice, and prudence what Plato and Aristotle refer to as higher and lower parts of the soul exist. For without the existence of such facultative parts of the soul, no proper subject of moral ed education exists that can be perfected through the habitual exercise of human choice under the direction of right reason and right desire, and what eventually St. Thomas will call beyond right desire, right pleasure. Hence, according to St. Thomas, not even having right desire accompanying right reason is enough to be perfectly virtuous. Beyond right desire to possess the virtue of prudence and perfect moral virtue, a person must actually experience right pleasure in making right moral choices. Consequently, a person who experiences psychological pain, discomfort, difficulty, doing a morally good deed, making a morally right choice, doing a courageous act, in no way acts virtuously. All virtue facilitates performance of facultative good acts and in accord with the faculty being exercised makes its possessor the faculty good. While this is especially so in the case of moral virtue, to some extent it's also true of all productive arts and practical skills in performance arts. A person who doesn't love doing a job well done huh, lacks the qualities of a serious professional and complete and perfect possession of the habit being exercised. This is so true that toward the end of his commentary on the Nicomachean ethics following Aristotle, St. Thomas goes so far as to identify happiness with the virtue of perfect pleasure. And to agree with Aristotle that to contend human happiness does not consist in a life of perfect pleasure is ridiculous, absurd. While this sort of identification might incline a person to accuse Aristotle and St. Thomas of reverting to a kind of moral or ethical hedonism, even moral relativism, nothing could be further from the truth. To prove that to be the case, St. Thomas makes a distinction between perfect and imperfect pleasure, and the sort of pleasure that accompanies exercise of perfect virtue. Whether talking about perfect or imperfect pleasure, St. Thomas does not identify the pleasure pursued by a healthy, concupiscible appetite or by the human will to be that of the many and the incontinent, that kind of pleasure that they pursue, that they tend to identify pleasure with, a process of satisfying desire like a thirsty person gulping down a glass of water. Instead, he identifies pleasure with a state of unimpeded rest in a good, a state of intellectual enjoyment in knowing that a person securely possesses an object of love. To drive his point home that such a state of pleasure must be an essential property of the virtue of happiness. He makes a distinction between two types of pleasure that accompany two types of virtue. One is the kind of virtue acquisition pleasure, a term that I'm going to try to make intelligible what he's talking about, that accompanies activities that a person performs while transforming imperfect possession of a virtue into perfect possession. For example, St. Thomas makes maintains that such a kind of virtue impeded by pain and struggle accompanies the hard work involved in becoming a professional in any art, science, or productive activity. A kind of qualitative, qualitatively different, imperfect, and a fear, inferior pleasure from that possessed by a grand master of an art or a science. Virtue possession pleasure, I call it. And St. Thomas claims that any of us who has ever succeeded at acquiring a difficult to achieve good habit can verify the truth of his claim 
through a simple act of self-reflection. According to St. Thomas, the kind of pleasure that accompanies perfect happiness is perfect pleasure, a kind of intellectual delight that only consummate professionals experience. Hence, he says, in the case of such people, science does not consist in a habit whose formal object consists in a genus divided by contrary opposites, one of which is imperfect possession of an organizational good. The reason for this is that a person on the top of his or her game does not tend to fail. If failure happens, it tends to be due to external conditions beyond the control of any consummate professional, not due to the qualitative condition of the professional's psychological condition. The grand master of living no more contemplates failure at living, the really happy life than a grand master of sports competition thinks of losing this or that game. According to St. Thomas, only a life of contemplation lived among a community of morally virtuous friends can provide such a happy life because only a contemplative community of morally perfect friends, one that chiefly pursues perfective good of the human soul, not useful goods or bodily pleasures, can generate the moral conditions for perfect human happiness. For only such a community, because it's not based upon transitory utilitarian goods and pleasures, but on psychological goods can last long term and inclined to get the best out of its members. Constitute of those members a community of grand masters of competition at living. This, I submit, is the only sort of life that will enable human beings to survive, not choke under the emotional pressure of digital competition, as Mark has been warning us about. Flourish in our growing digital age and simultaneously produce within it the kinds of present and future leaders we need to promote global peace. Thank you. I'll be happy to entertain some questions if you have them, or if you don't want me to stand in the way of your beer, you know, we can. You know. But uh, what do you say? Do you want to sit Yeah, and you can turn. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between your description and the view of the British empiricists? Well, the British empiricists don't tend to ex accept the existence of the faculty of culture. The, 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 you have an association of sense feelings that feel each other to be united in some way. It's a kind of Gnostic, kind of, kind of, kind of Gnostic spiritualism, as far as I can say. You can, they can't identify the individual subject of power. This is the whole. This is the whole problem with modern philosophy and modern time. There is no knowing subject that's engaged in the act of philosophy or science. Huh? Uh, they, they, you, you have repeatedly people who are denying uh, or, or making inexplicable what is the thing known and who is doing the known, and yet they claim to be scientists or philosophers. I maintain that that's absurd. That's a ridiculous claim. How can anybody, anybody take that seriously? You know, these people should be, uh, uh, should be locked up somewhere. That's <laughs> 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 yes, Well, of course, the, the modern philosopher of science, like philosopher, will say, come on, you've got to identify um, cognitive faculties in some part of the brain. Okay. So, where is this estimated or cogitated? Well, some I, I don't know of anybody who necessarily, who necessarily said that. Well, the, the physical. Well, you might be the first, okay? Right? I mean, in some way, like they try and identify it with, with brain cells or whatever. I mean, it's not very precise because there's not very much one can be, be precise right. about it. Right. But um, so this estimated or cogitated set, which uh, is very interesting, rather peculiar sense. Right. Um, how is that going to fit in? Is it, well, is that just a spiritual reality? Or? No, no, it, it, it is totally material in the sense you're describing. It's, it's, it's subject to physical physical laws of, of attraction and repulsion and so on, movement of the moon, you know. Things of, things of this sort, and so it's deterministic and no, no, no liberty. Without liberty, you can't produce the, 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 uh, uh, the moral culture that you need to 
to generate prudence uh, on a, a kind of experiential level, you know, uh, uh, high enough for people to realize that we're done in some way. This is dangerous to be in this condition. We need to improve our lives uh, and, and to, to cooperate and to, to develop uh, productive arts uh, and perform in performance arts, uh, the uh, uh, developing tools uh, and, and from those developing facultative uh, perfections. Uh, so they, they can't expect in still necessary conditions of liberty uh, that would be necessary to develop a, a scientific culture. Got a question back. Magna Arnold, who we spoke of earlier, who may be the most outstanding attempt at Thomistic psychology, has a big, thick book with two sections. The first part, the title of the book is Memory and Brain. And so the first section of that is a very elaborate, clearly Thomistic description of memory. The second part is a very detailed part by part neuroanatomy of it, that may be a first approximation of, of trying to correlate uh, interior senses with neuroanatomy. And I don't know if anybody's done what's, what's the title of the book? Memory of the Brain. Right. And St. Thomas associates cogitative reasoning. Just a very minor point. Uh, thank you for your paper. Um, uh, you said that the sheep, as uh, is, is aware that it's a sheep, and that the wolf is a wolf. Well, and, and just having, that. having to reflect on this lot. <laughs> so, certainly, particular reason, as we said, I say that I'm the father, uh, whatever, I'm not, well, I could say I'm the father, I should, whatever, take care of my son. Um, but uh, once again, the particular reason is propositional. And so, um, uh, right, with the sheep, it, it's, I think, I think for Thomas, it's much more instinctual than that. Yeah. So, so he, he really describes estimation in terms of instinct. Yeah. Animals much, right. and perhaps he doesn't give them quite enough credit in certain ways, but but it does, it, 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 there's supposed to be one little thing on the just yeah, I see what you're saying. Start, you, yeah, you, you, you have to set the immaterial consciousness of self that you're not right. going to have on the sense level. So mm -hmm. just that it, an epicenter, right? It realizes that it's a threat, and there is a relation yeah. there because it realizes that it's a threat to it. I mean, right. the wolf doesn't perceive another right. wolf as a threat. Right. Uh, or, but yeah. um, now, it sense fear. You have this. You have to sense sense weakness, uh, which which would would indicate that you're experiencing your your own individuality in some way, right? right. At least generically, it, it might be experiencing yeah. itself as a, 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 a meal for wolves. Right. I'm not opposed. Uh, to, I'm not opposed to the idea of the. And, and I think it'd be helpful. To, yeah. Think more about what that. I'm not opposed to any of some self-awareness on the part of the animal because, um, really, I mean, I think Thomas describes the common sense has a kind of self-awareness, uh, but right. maybe something like what you said, like a feeling of weakness, because certainly um, even with at one sheep with another sheep, the whole hierarchy of yeah. like the alpha member, it, it's kind of evaluating its own strength against another. So in that sense, there would be a kind of self. Awareness, but but not necessarily that it's a sheep, but maybe of its right. And like you said, that first appears on the level of common sense. Right. Uh, but what doesn't what doesn't appear on that level is this sense of awareness of, of good and evil, and a sense of aware a generic sense of awareness at least of the nature of things, the right. reality of good and evil. And the, what's crucial to recognize about that is that the, the extent to which you get predominance. In the uh, in your, your behavior to incontinence and intemperance, the inclination is not to listen to reason and to consider reason to, to identify pleasure and good and pain and evil, and to rec and, and, and to consider any kind of of, uh, of uh, conversation about changing the way you behave to be acts of violence. Uh, irrational forms of behavior, right? and so uh, the, the situation becomes you can't reason with these kinds of people, uh, and when they become your political leaders you know, on a global scale, uh, uh, then uh, you're in really serious danger uh, because they they can't they 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 become totally incapable 
of recognizing the, the existence of natures and things. They can't, they can't recognize courage, for example. They can't even respect it because they can't recognize it. Uh, and they, they experience a certain kind of contempt for it. It's kind of like a backwardness uh, opposed to an, an enlightenment consciousness. Well, on this note, um, it's interesting because Averroes actually kind of characterizes in his commentary on ethics. He characterizes the quotidian as the source of error. He ca characterizes the, the intellect, which is separate for him, what the act of intentional flesh is separate for Averroes. And so they, they're the source of truth, but the quotidian is, is what misleads us. And Thomas, to some degree, inherits that because he says the quotidian is responsible for belief and opinion. Because the intellect um, knows what is certain, but the intellect doesn't, a matter of opinion, if it's something that's uncertain, that's not a proper intellectual judgment, it's a quotidian judgment. So you could argue that when people kind of fall away from a sound, realist ethics, even if it's a so-called philosophical, utilitarian, or human so-called ethics, that actually they're functioning more in the level of their quotidian than, on, than of, their, of their intellect. That they're actually not functioning in a proper human way. They're more or less the loss of the quotidian reason. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, they're functioning on the level of less native sense. They become more brutish in their response. Can I speak to Peter's question? Sure. You know, in, in the, uh, my field of interest, the reason I'm fascinated in Peter's work, and I've been increasingly interested in the past few years in cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay? And one of the problems that people in cognitive behavioral science have is we talk about uh, the person. Behavior has to be controlled from its internal focus of control, as opposed to an external focus of control. I explained that when I gave my paper. Uh, for example, if I flunk an exam, it's the teacher's fault, it's, or if it's the school's fault or the system. It's always something out there in the external focus. The internal focus is I, I have the ability to estimate, to look for example within myself, look within my own soul, for want of a better term. So, so cognitive psychology talks about this internal focus of control, but they never quite define it, or they never quite get at it. You know? They're not sure what it is, okay? And so then they start going into personality traits and so forth, and we'll do cycle. But the cognitive behavioral people don't like doing that stuff because they don't want to get too far into the black box of the brain because they think they're going to get lost there and you're not going to find out anything anyway, you know? So, so what they say is, you know, the client here has got some beliefs that aren't working. You know, he estimates the world <clears throat> the wrong way if I do a talk in terms of Peter's language. So I think what Peter's coming up with here, as I've worked with him, is very important, at least for me, in the work of cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive behavioral counseling, okay, because it helps me define uh, and have some sense of science when talking to other colleagues in cognitive behavioral therapy is my definition of what term is. The internal locus of control in the person, which is increasing over the years, an estimated sense, and increasing your habit of prudence, of, of prudence, and increasing your habits of good practical reasoning, which people go, that's why people you know, are, are crazy. You know, they're bad problem solvers. That's the cognitive of behavioral therapy. Okay? You know, why am I so messed up? Why am I doing the rally and sick? You don't solve problems well. And, uh, and so it's very valuable for me. It helps me define what I would call the internal locus of control in the person. And if, I'm, and if I don't, and I'm not able to control that in time, I don't have an internal focus of control, I don't see myself as a valuable person of work. Okay. And, and I, I think, too, St. Thomas talks about the computer and irascible appetites, but he never, I haven't found any <clears throat> explicitly identifying the locus of the concupiscible appetite on the level of the common sense, being immediately, immediately reacting to what's present in the imagination. Uh, and I think once you make that distinction, right, and that it immediately is reacting to that, and that's why you can't make a distinction between between real and apparent good, and and yet it is inclined to listen to the irascible appetite, and the irascible appetite is in contact with read with with reality through sense memory uh, and, and the particular reason, then you have the foundation for moral consciousness. I didn't understand the idea that the intellect can't be false. That doesn't sound... 
What you, you said? You said you get into like this is the Aristotle's idea. Um, well, so Aristotle says that the concepts are infallible as such, um, and so Aristotle says there can be falsity in, in judgments. Uh, the question is, um, if you have concepts that that are that are sound, how do you get a false judgment from uh, from sound concepts? So if I have a sound concept of a human, then how do I say humans aren't rational? That would be a problem. Uh, the way that Aquinas solves that problem is by saying that, well, the way that Verwey solves that problem is by saying that if you say humans are not rational, you're not using intellect at all, you're using cogitative. The way that Aquinas solves the problem is by saying that if you say humans aren't rational, this is the neighbor top the uh, question one, uh, it's like Article 10 or 11, is there falsity in intellect? Um, he says you're just putting together things that shouldn't be put together. So you have two different solutions. Uh, I think Averroes doesn't really work because for him, I, I don't think it's entirely ascribable to the cogitative. Uh, one instance where you can see a false judgment in a pure intellectual being is the devil. So that, that, that's, that kind of shows you that you do have falsity even in intellect. So, so the idea that intellect can never be false, that's an averroistic, rationalistic claim that, um, that Aquinas does not agree with. But I, I was just kind of just bringing that in, uh, in, in, in relation to the points that Peter is making. Yeah, it sounds you notice, because I was presenting obviously novel material. Right. The presentations I made today have never been made before, not just to this crowd, but to anyone. Um, and so, I don't know if you noticed in that, there were a number of people in the audience who were trying to apply morality to what I was saying. Mm -hmm. Is that good or evil? And I kept resisting that. Um, I'm partly on behalf of McClure, who... Uh, yeah, but you contradicted you yourself. You, you, you said that, sure I did. that television's useless. It has detrimental effects on the young. So and you I, kept, saw, and I kept saying there are also very positive uh, benefits. I, I kept saying that, in fact, consuming vast amounts of things we don't need um, isn't an, an entirely, isn't an evil. Which is begging the question. That they're all, You're saying we don't need them. I find them extremely useful. And many people will. And in fact, I said all, all, all sorts of wealth and all sorts of other things are generated. Um, as a result of that. But my point here is that something was going on in the audience here in the interaction between the intellect or whatever faculty was hearing what I was saying and attempts to apply morality to it mm -hmm. and a back and forth was going on. So there was some interplay of these internal senses yeah. going on as I was speaking to the audience. Sure, because you have to have a that the particular reason cognitive reason prepared prepares the, the sensible content to 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 be uh, to be capable of the acting as a subject for abstraction, a suitable subject from which to abstract content. So you know, that would be a normal procedure for people to engage. So my question is um, McClellan's continued insistence on avoiding doing that because it impairs our ability to understand. That the, that, so I'm wondering, as you've architected this, this somewhat more fundamental inclination, right. appetite of inclination to apply good and evil, mm -hmm. um, have you thought much, or can you say much about how that may interfere with our ability to, um, for the intellect? Uh, because by the time the intellect it's a whole of what we're, we're dealing with. It's, it's already, sort of, already sort of been steered, uh, morally steered, and that distorts our ability to understand. Well, if, if you're morally steered to be more precisely in touch with reality, you're going to precisely <coughs> identify the natures of things. If in addition to this, these faculties, you have the performance arts and sciences, uh, and so it's going to be helpful. Like St. Thomas gave the example of the person who's got a skill of being a carpenter who excels at it. You have somebody who's got the skill of being a dancer and so forth. And uh, the, uh, if, if that person is possessed of prudence, the, the, that person's going to be engaged in good, in, in good habits of health uh, that uh, will, will attempt to promote the career, the, the career, the life. Huh? Uh, but if a person a person becomes uh, you know is a great athlete or a great uh, 
a performer, a great professional in, in some field, and they become drug addicted, uh, then that's going to impair them. That's the circum the, the, those are the eight circumstances that, uh, that surround the performance of any uh, of any uh, practical activity. The practical activity has those kinds of eight circumstances. That's multiplied by the moral uh, the moral culture that corporations really recognize they exist within. The moral culture has to pre-exist the generation of the, the the corporation because you have to be prudent enough to be able to engage in the work that you. Build up the personal relations. So to me, to me, the development of, of human organizations is always chiefly the way of building up personal relations. Uh, and the person who's who run, who's who excels at being a good uh, a good leader is a person who who has that skill of understanding the personal relations, so that you're correlating the people in the different departments and the different divisions with the skill sets that they have that can interrelate with the other parts to create this harmonious uh, unity. How, how this uh, description that you presented leads to leadership? Well, uh, because leadership only occurs within a genus. Uh, leader, uh, leadership only occurs within the context of an organization, right? And it occurs incipient, incipiently. Uh, same, as Aristotle says, the end is in the beginning. As soon as you start to build the, uh, a, a, a unity among a plurality, that plurality has to be qualified so that the beings that are connected, that you're connecting, can interrelate and relate to each other uh, and now become transformed as parts of a whole. And they can't become transformed as parts of a whole unless there's a common aim. And one activity that exists throughout all of the different members uh, to which they are unequally related, uh, that, that serves as an underlying principle that's observed in their harmony, uh, the harmony of the operation. That's why I say induction is, all, is concerned chiefly about recognizing harmony and beauty uh, in, a, in an organizational whole. A person who uh, has a good sense of a familiarity, and this is, this is the sense memory, for example, huh? in, the, in the estimative sense, uh, can walk into an organization right, and just take an instant look at it and says, say, this place is falling apart. Right? Uh, goes from the particular to universal, makes the invalid logical jump that the logician is going to say, how can somebody say that kind of thing? Kind of thing. You know, like Donald Trump will say, I know these rats, these rats in you know, the Republican Party, I know what they're doing behind the scenes. They're out to get me. And then people will say, oh, this man's bad. I say, this man's from New York. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> he, he, worked, he, worked, he worked in Queens. You know, yeah. yeah. so, so really, you know it's tough guys. <laughs> This actually goes back to your first talk. I didn't get a chance to ask question. Do you mind if I ask you? Of course. Are you from, so you're familiar with Aquinas' Mariology, his distinction of wholes and parts. It seems like that's very central to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Organizational whole. So right, Aquinas distinguishes integral wholes, like house. Mm -hmm. Subjective whole would be a uh, universal, a genus is divided into species, um, and various other kinds of holes. Uh, right, right. Uh, so that's his Mariology. So which of these would an organizational whole be? So for example, let's say Aristotle begins in the Chimacanetics, uh, talking about the army, the final cause of the army. It seems like that's very present in your saying right. here. Uh, right, the general has, the goal is victory, but right. everyone is contributing to that and so forth. But just in terms of Mariology, which kind of whole is this an integral whole? Is, are you aware? Does Thomas address that? Or, I haven't really thought about that. Doesn't he say that it's a unity yeah. of order? What were you saying? A unity of order. It's a unity of order, no? Yes. So, you know, and I think that's so there's actually, something that is first, right? And there's right, something that is. I think that would. I think you could call that an integral whole. 
Okay. You, know, you do that with respect to number where the last number creates the creates the unity. But the, right. the, the point that I'm trying to I got this I got this insight from Jilson's painting of reality. Okay, of course this passage in it. Magnificent work. <coughs> it's great with metaphysical insight. And and he, he has this one passage, and I'm paraphrasing it, where he says that the only way to unify a multitude uh, is the order. Okay. And, and that also, well, okay. but every kind of whole is, is essentially ordered, right? Yeah. So the house, there's an order of the parts. Right. Yeah. Um, there's an order between species and genus right. in the sense that yeah. species yeah. is ordered to this right. Right. So unit order seems like a rather generic. Even a number is one of the so, components of it. The only yeah. way is because the order is to the extent that this multitude, this pluralization, huh, becomes limited and qualified in terms of a, a, a common relation, unequal relation to an aim, an end. Numeric to one act. Right? So if if you get rid of the notion that real aims exist in reality, you get rid of contrary opposition. Um, okay. And how does okay. that follow? Well, there are four types of opposites for saying that. Right. right? Contrary to the contrary contrary okay. Right. And, okay. So you can't you can't have science studying contradictory opposites. No, okay. of course not. So it studies contrary opposites. Con contrary contrary opposites. This is in the procedural analytics. Okay. Right, yeah. And, and, and to have contrary opposition, you have to have inequality of perfection, right? qualitative possession, which is, this relates to St. Thomas' the notion of virtual quantity. Okay. Uh, only, and, and it's related to that this scholastic, uh, uh, commonly used uh, the phrase, whatever is received into a receiver is according to the capacity of the receiver. So the reception of the generic unity, uh, the corporate, Unity um, uh, it, it, um, that has to has to exist first before you have corporate action, right? Presupposes the reality of aims. Get rid of the reality of aims, and you got rid of contrary opposition. I still don't see how contrary opposition comes in. Well, because without, saying, but without the single out, get rid of get rid well, of victory, the, the, the so the victory, victory and defeat would be contrary yeah. opposition. Right. So basically, you're saying. We have. We're, we're really. We're not just seeking anything. Our goal is, is to defeat the enemy. It's yeah. not. It's not yeah. for us to our, just our, do something the, else. The, the, the maximum in the genus is the measure, right? Okay. And so the, the maximum in health becomes the measure. You know, in the uh, in the medical body, for example, right? Get rid of health. We get rid of medicine being related to health. Uh, but it's not sustainable. Oh, well, but this is exactly what the postmoderns want to say. Yes. Is that nothing is ordered. To, nothing has a proper that's right. order. That's that's right. Right. So, but that's what postmodern philosophy yeah, is. Right. Right. Yeah. Very, yeah. very. Or is it a postmodern philosophy? It's not going to be postmodern. But, okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, 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 so, the reality of aims is the necessary. I, I think Aristotle came up with the notion of substance and the reality of aims simultaneously. Uh, and right. contrary opposition. And now a light bulb went on in his head, <laughs> and he said, when he recognized final causality, and the, the dominance of final causality, it gives him the notion of contrary opposites. That gives him the notion of inequality of perfect possession, uh, of unity uh, of, of unity and action. And you can have a hierarchy of, 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 of sciences qualitatively uh, uh, related. Huh? And corresponding to that qualitative relation of different organizational wholes, you, you have habits uh, that start with conceptual abstraction and conclude in judgmental abstraction. But, and just one thing I would just add, I mean, you have a hierarchy of sciences, but also, of course, a hierarchy of arts. Because if yeah, you're talking right. about organizational unity, you're, right. you're, you're talking about art as well. I mean, the, the, the military is it's an art. It's more Absolutely. than a science, yeah. because it is a practice. And that comes the fact that those arts have to come first. Uh, the, for, for Aristotle, the, it's the productive the arts that, pre uh, that presuppose yeah. the performance arts. You know, you have to have the tools that. But for, what's performance arts? Uh, the, these these would be both uh, um, uh, faculty arts that develop facultative perfections huh? through mm -hmm. through habits, rather than uh, the the facultative nature in relationship to happiness. Uh, it would involve, aside from making tools. The perfection of different performance activities of the person, okay. so, your, your your mental activities, and, as, as well as dance, theater, symphonies. What about baseball team? Huh? 
Yeah, that would be a performance of how they compete and they cooperate to have to work. That's not, to me, it's always the best metaphor. Yeah. So there's not an extrinsic product that's produced like right. a Right, right, right. It's difficult to talk about what you know what you mean by art when Aristotle is talking about it. I made a distinction between what I call productive arts and performance arts. Sure, that's helpful. Right. Right. So it makes it a little, okay. a little, yeah, little but, but there's a hierarchy there, there's a hierarchy with respect to the tools. But what's crucial about recognize is once you get rid of that, that, that numerically one act, right? The, it, you, want to, you want to put out the fire over here. Well, no, fires aren't real. There's no real ancient firemen to put out fires. Well, they're not firefighters. What the heck are you talking about? You know, you destroy the, you destroy the language. Your language has no definite subject. You're not definite. You're not, you have no definite thing talking about no definite subject. Or what do you teach them? I'm a university professor. <laughs> Can I say one, one lesson on that same from your previous talk? Um, you say Aristotle speaks about a right limit of pleasure as determining right. habits. Uh, is there a text you have in mind there? I'm just curious. Do you think, about, do you think about the idea of the, the mesotase as the object of, of the virtue, the, the mean? Is that what you have in mind? There, the mean? Or is it different? No, different? I think he gets this actually from the. the, 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 the Could you talk about right pleasure, but I've never right seen that in Aristotle. It's in the Nicomachean it's Ethics uh, toward the. Uh, I'm just book kidding. eight, book nine, ten. When he's talking about, he's talking about uh, 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 the uh, uh, happiness uh, and and arguing against uh, some of the I think it was Platonists uh, uh, who, uh, who who were maintaining uh, that uh, you uh, well, that the pleasure is. could be, not be united with happiness. And some of them were some of them were identifying pleasure with the process. And he said, well, no, pleasure is not, you know, that's an in inadequate pleasure, even on the concupiscible level, because real, real pleasure is unimpeded rest uh, and the enjoyment of what you really, what you consider really good as an object of love. Uh, and the, the notion that like, like doing it, come up with later on, that pleasure is actually a process. If you hold that notion, then you're going, not be go going to be inclined to identify happiness with pleasure, and I think that uh, as the son of a, 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 a physician who recognized that the, the, the body uh, tends to tends to repel against uh, uh, excesses uh, of one sort or another by generating pain in those uh, in, in the, those parts where you you overdo uh, or underdo uh, a, uh, a suitable proportionate relation. Uh, to to uh, qualitative receptivity of, of something uh, that he recognized and transposed that 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 he's this is the one reason I call this is a, a psychology you know, he, he's he's a physician of the soul right? and and the, the 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 moral virtues are perfections of the soul that overflow into the entire human person and they're they're beautifications of the soul. Uh, of, of virtual quantum perfection, qualitative perfections huh? that maximize the perfection of operation, and that requires limitation. And, uh, uh, as anybody who's engaged in any kind of art tends to recognize, dealing with dealing with people who are extremely talented. Huh? The genius of somebody who's a, who, who is an orchestra leader, for example, is, is precisely the fact that you can get people who are who don't tend to be easily directed, right? To listen to reason and to modify and to moderate and create honesty. So wherever you have a healthy organization, the first thing that you immediately recognize is the harmony in, in, the, in the group operation through the beauty of the performance. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, 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 it's something that causes uh, a, a, a reaction on the part of uh, people who recognize it that uh, enables enables it to be to be compared. Because Aristotle says two qualities cannot be directly compared. Uh, like you can't if the best of can, but if they're they're distinct qualities. Well, but not one to each other. You have to have a, a cause effect type of relation. You have to see the effect you know of, that this has and that over there has. On the same thing, like, and this this carries over into modern physics, where what they're doing is measuring qualities. Right? The heat is a quality, right? But they're measuring in terms of something like a thermometer, or you know, even something like weight, 
which has a relation like the quality, and you use the balance scale, right? And you can indirectly measure measure both of them for a beauty pageant, you know, or something, uh, and you see audience reaction, the same sort of thing. Huh? And so it's it, it's not the case that there's no real good or, uh, or evil that's being observed, huh? but it's being measured in different ways. Peter doesn't follow for what you're saying that there is that modern science is a fraud because yes. it denies teleology. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I, 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 the best description I have of it is a mathematically regulated, regulated, regulated shrewdness. Okay. Well, you know, this, and, and this is why math, the people who claim that the whole of truth is located in mathematical physics are claiming that the whole of prudence is located there. And if you take a look at the way they talk about science, like Hobbes does, for example, like the spaniel arranging the field and so forth, and the, the ability to predict, you know, making a, a prejudgment, having providential kind of knowledge. They're claiming that, that only the physical science scientists engages in prudential judgment, strictly speaking, and outside of that, you have, you, you have opinions, so they have to come up with a fairy tale, <laughs> these historical fables that they turn into a metaphysics uh, to justify that, and they use utopian socialism uh, as, a, as a way of maintaining that, that kind of uh, uh, illusion about uh, them being the only ones in possession of science. So, so when you were talking about the composer being able to orchestrate all those different people who can, you know, doing that necessarily work together, does it, do you also, uh, how do you take into account also someone who can identify that those people can go together? So like the previous step of the composer says, I'm recruiting that person, because I see that end. Is that's the person with estimated intelligence. That's the, you have to have the, the, you have to have the experience it's a it's it's a pair alley of notum notum alley of notum principle. Can I ask you about estimated intelligence? Mm -hmm. You said something really suggestive earlier on about I'm trying to remember your words. But I'll use my own words. The, the leader with estimated intelligence, he's leading his organization. He's taking taking a read of the pre-existing moral landscape, and only because that's there first is he able to make this estimation that's right. required. And marshal the forces to achieve the goal. Right. Okay, so if you can conceive it that way, then bringing back to this idea of uh, technologies to understand them in their extrinsic formal causality, let's consider them morally neutral. Is that possible? I mean, is it not the case that the leader with estimated intelligence sees a moral need and the technology is, is, is responding to it in a way that no one, no one else has envisioned. I'll just give an example, and I'll ask you to comment on it. Uh, a lot of people look to Steve Jobs. Here's a visionary. People can be cynical. He invented a bunch of crap that we didn't need. Mm -hmm. Made us all think right. we needed this useless stuff, and it's ruined our lives. Right. Okay, so there we go with this moral evaluation, which I agree with you. Uh, Mark clouds up the issue. But that's not how marketing works. That's marketing fulfills anticipated. I, I agree. So I, I'm giving they voice to the push this. They don't that's push. not my voice. I would want to say, in harmony with what you said, Peter, this is why what you said really captured my attention that, you know, Jobs has a better read, right? His estimate of intelligence knows what people want. That's right. That's right. So it's not that we didn't know we wanted it, it's like he was able to estimate what right. we wanted. Right. Right. And that would be the genius of, of the leader. Yeah. And maybe yeah. Mark would have a comment yeah. on, on and, that. In that respect, too. I mean, you, you, this is where I think McLuhan, you know, it, McLuhan was examining the external senses for the most part. And it never gets beyond internally the, the common sense. He doesn't really go into this, the, the operations of, of the, uh, the, the cogitative agitated faculty and all of this. And, and th there's always a, a, moral, a, a moral culture that, that, deter that, that enters into uh, the determination of the professional activity. I, I, I always been struck by you know, the fact that uh, Peter DeMarco, whenever he uh, approaches professionals and he asks about an activity uh, and, and, and doing something, uh, uh, the first thing he, he asks is, is it safe? <laughs> is it the need doable? Yeah, but is it, should we be doing it now, <laughs> over here, under these circumstances and conditions? Right? So there's there's a kind of prudential judgment, and I think this is where 
McLuhan's insights about the dangers of technologies and what they bring with them can cloud the prudential judgment, right? Uh, and and that clouding of the prudential judgment uh, then can can then impact on the ability of the business, right? Uh, short term or long term, ultimately to 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 survive. Mm -hmm. uh, big story about Steve Jobs, and then you can relate this to the uh, um, moral judgments that, that you're describing. Um, among the other pursuits that I've had, I wind up being the historian of LSD. Um, and so uh, Steve Jobs and I were both speaking at a conference um, in the mid-90s, and I approached him in the green room behind stage. And I said, Steve, could you tell me the most remarkable thing that ever happened to you on LSD was? Steve turned to me and he said, what are you talking about? What, what do you know about this stuff? I started rattling off a series of things that he had no idea about. I said, all right, all right, all right. See, they know something about this stuff. So I was tricking my brains off, and I met the devil. And I believe I sold him my soul. Now you said that was Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs said that. <laughs> I've met the devil many times, and I refused to sell my soul as best I understand it. Steve Jobs told me he met the devil and sold his soul in exchange for charisma. So what we are identifying as Steve Jobs, the leader, he believed to his death, it's the way he dealt with his pancreatic cancer, was completely consistent with this. He believed the devil was coming back for him um, in his pancreatic cancer. And so I said to him, so I get it. Um, somebody hold up your iPhone. There's, a, there's an apple. And I said, so that little curve taken out of the apple is the devil. That, that is, this is a satanic symbol, sign, that you put on all of your products. And so here we now take all the rest of what you know about Steve Jobs. Um, with Steve Jobs, we're potentially dealing with demons. Uh, how do we think through the um, moral implications of products of that sort? Um, probably plenty others, but that one in particular, um, standing out to us. That there, there's or, or let me put it this way, in that same quote that I um, made from McLuhan to Dr. Mark Thomas, um, a sentence or two later, he says, well, Jacques, you know, the prince of this world is a great electrical engineer. <laughs> so there is not an absence of moral judgment and some of the things that McLuhan was talking about. And in, indeed, I'm sorry to be the first one to invoke this, although uh, exorcisms came up in, in an earlier uh, explanation, there are, the devil's involved in many of these things we've been talking about throughout this conference. How are our in, internal faculties to deal with that? Grace. So the, the three wows as he was dying was his encounter with the devil as opposed to seeing the magnificent magnificence of, of his career. Um, my wife and I were watching the World Series and the Royals were playing. And some of her school teacher, church friends were over and the daughters were getting up to play and the ladies were saying, I like him because he's such a, he and his wife are really good Christians. <coughs> I said, ladies, it's the talk of the night. It's the World Series final game. We're two runs down. I don't care if the apple himself comes up the back. I want a home run. So whether he had a loony or whether he was a whack job, he fulfilled a wonderful customer for me. Even Satan had quote scripture. There's the bottom line. There's the bottom line. <laughs> That's growth, not prosperity. Satan <laughs> quote scripture. <laughs> Aristotle says something close close to that with respect to uh, 
uh, the incontinent and intemperate. Um, uh, just, uh, are, is everyone familiar with the text of the day model on this, on the temptation? Do you recall that? I, I, I don't recall it offhand. How the devil tempts? So the, so the yeah. point is, teaches, the question is raised in the day model, which is, of course, the dispute question on evil. I think it's question 16. It's toward the end. Um, and so the question is raised, how does the devil tempt? And so, right, Thomas says, the devil has no access to our intellect or our will. So he, because right. Augustine had taught, see, he cannot know the secrets of the heart. And so he says, he tempts us, and he uses the word cogitative. He says he tempts us by the cogitative power and by the internal senses. Yes. So the devil, he can't affect my intellect or my will because um, they don't have a material organ. But because there's a material organ now, of course, Thomas's biology or neurology is outdated. So he says he can do it by moving the, the sensory spirits, the, the Galenic spirits, which is outdated. But right. mutatis mutandis, um, no, no, no. and he can. So, for example, the devil he says could make you imagine maybe an image. Right. Um, and I don't, I don't really see him affecting our. I, I don't think it would apply to the uh, the common sense because this common sense is in a kind of direct continuity with the external senses. I think we would have to um, mm -hmm. inhibit the uh, function of our common sense by right. using drugs precisely without that would inhibit it. Mm -hmm. But um, but certainly the imaginative and the coach So oh, yeah, but that I, I'm sure you're familiar with. Yeah, he talks about it. It's also in the Summa as well. Right, right. In the Compendium of Theology, when he talks about the temptation of Eve, he talks about he talks about uh, Eve being tempted in the concupiscible appetite, and he says that the devil sought to, to attack man uh, to attack mankind in its lower flank. Yeah. So, but that was verbal, at least if you take it literally. So this is interior temptation because there's he divides it up into external and, and there's an external temptation to the devil or to life from the world, for example, mm -hmm. like things we see on on television, right. Right. which certainly I think is a very negative aspect of the media in our world today. I mean, as wonderful as things like technology can be, I mean, there's a huge amount of evil done to the internet with pornography and other things, mm -hmm. and. Uh, other media as well, but so there's external temptations and internal temptations, and internal temptations never go directly to the intellect. So that's a very important role right. for a particular reason, and maybe even in the incontinent man, there's mm -hmm. th that, well, that that production yeah, of the role well, right. syllogism. That, maybe that, I mean, well, that could go through without, the sense, yeah, yeah, that would go through the sense of touch. But yeah. the way temperance, the virtue of temperance, deals with with uh, moderation but, of um, yeah, tactile moderation, pleasures. Tactile pleasures. But C.S. Lewis says the devil. Always has to appear attractive. Right. Which we take letters, or the devil has to appear in his ideology more than anything. Mm -hmm. That's where he's really successful. That's when the devil, you know, they're having their big banquet and he congratulates everybody. We had a wonderful year. We've gone through communism, we've gone through this Nazi, <laughs> and now we're the postmodernist. So <laughs> that's the devil. It really works as in the ism. So. Right. It's not the detail. It's the ism. So that's why we have a St. Thomas. <laughs> well, I, I don't think I can accept this Manichaean view of technology. Everything uh, technological comes from the devil. I mean, this apocryphal story about Steve Jobs, is it corroborated by anyone else? Did he say what he said to you to anyone else? Okay. Well, I mean, there are biographies. You know, mm -hmm. Someone else could. Well, there are biographies that don't flip. I know many people who knew Steve Jobs. As I described this, they've said to me, that sounds exactly right. Um, and the way he behaved at the end of his life, and the way he treated his pancreatic cancer, could only be explained. The way he refused medicine, and the way he sought out witch doctors, the occult uh, attractions that he had. Uh, he, 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 he thought the devil was coming for his juice. Um, on just on the note, because I, I teach a course on angelology and demonology, and so um, Father Ian Morton is very good on this. He has a two two volume work, which I'm <coughs> crashing bread. You're familiar with Gabriel and Morton? Yeah, yeah. His two books. So, I mean, it's not it's not a, it's not necessarily um, fantastic to think that someone's on their soul to devil. As a matter of fact, in demonology, and this is this is Catholic theology. This is not like fantasy. Or, Dealing is very negative about, about exorcism and witch hunts. Mm -hmm. But actually, I mean, this is part of Catholic theology. And Father Ingmorth, I mean, has direct experience of this. It's in the Gospels. And so right. Dilly can be very modernistic on this. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that's one of those things. <laughs> but uh, without getting sidetracked side into that. So, um, so, 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 for example, uh, 
John Lennon, there's a recent book that you might want to look at about John Lennon that I had read decades ago about him selling, selling his soul to the devil. Apparently, this was in a, a magazine that he told one of his friends. He said, I just sold my soul to the devil, and I'm going to be, the, I'm going to be more famous than Jesus yeah, Christ. Okay, there's angelology, and then there's superstition. Right. Is there such but a thing is, metaphysically as a transaction where you sell your soul? Well, like, come on, but see, this is where the ghost story No, it's not. This is this is Thomas the Well, it's so, this is so, this so, is so, this so, is so, so, no, 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 I'm not. This is demonology. So, so this is what we're doing. Yeah, we're becoming rational. Do you sign the contract on me? We Just like there is a Speaking of spirits, I'd like to have a shot. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. Thank well you. Mic drop.